Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSPI podcast. I'm here today with uh, Gail Harriet. Gail, how are you doing? I am just fine. How about you? I'm um, doing great. Um, thanks for coming on. Uh, can you describe uh, sort of who you are and what you do to the audience? Okay. Um, I am a professor of law at the University of San Diego School of Law. Uh, I'm also a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. That's a part-time job. Um, but obviously, I'm speaking here more in my capacity as professor of law because, like, I don't want to be speaking in my capacity as a government official here. Um, okay, yeah, of course. Okay, D- duly duly noted. Uh, so, could you explain to people what is the what is the Civil Rights Commission? The Civil Rights Commission was established back in 1957, um, and basically, it is a, a commission that issues reports. Um, that back in 1957, that was the first civil rights legislation to come out of uh, the federal government since Reconstruction. Uh, and what it did is it set up the Civil Rights Commission to sort of, you know, find facts. Uh, there was a lot more disagreement than you would think back in those days uh, about, you know, what was actually happening on the ground. Um, and we've been around for, for quite some time now. It was, was reconfigured during the Reagan administration. Um, and basically has eight members. They are all part-time. Four of them are appointed by the president, four by Congress. I was appointed by the United States Senate on the recommendation of Senator McConnell. Um, And about three or four, well, in a good year, we issue three or four reports. In a bad year, not so many. And they and they're they're like consensus reports. The 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 both everyone. So it sounds like there's political diversity. It's usually a Republicans and Democrats, or if both parties control Congress, if both parties if one party controls both branches, uh, there control. will always be at least two uh, dissenters. Um, you know, at least two people who are are, are appointed uh, by the party that is out of power. Um, right now, we are four four. We've been four four for just a little while. Uh, for a long time, we were 6'2", and my colleague Peter Kersenow, who's a lawyer from, from, from Ohio, from Cleveland, uh, he and I were the two conservatives. But now we have four conservatives. And the reports, um, well, the commissioner's individual statements often say a lot more than the report itself. You get, you get more, more of, a, of, a, of a diversity of viewpoint in the statements than you do in the staff-created um, part of the report. Uh-huh. So the, the reports that you, you are able to uh, put together a, something like a consensus document, and then you have sort of like in a court case where you have concurrences and dissents, something like that. Except for the report is not not you know when when the when the, when the uh, commission was six two, the report itself was not consensus. Um, it was it was the the left of center progressive view, uh, and Pete and I would issue our dissents. And now now that it's four four. I wouldn't say that the reports are quite consensus, um, but, you know, we come as close as we can. Um, and, you know, if we dissent, we dissent. Yeah. And, and, how, and, do, pe- and so do people uh, working in sort of the area of civil rights law, do they take, they take the Civil Rights Commission very seriously? Because it sounds like, you know, it's not just a group that provides information. It's got a history of being taken seriously. Uh, yeah, and it has really gone into a lot of congressional legislation in the past particularly in the 1960s, though, because that's when there was so much civil rights legislation. Um, Some of the reports have been um, utterly crazy, uh, and I hope no one took them seriously, except (laughs) seriously. Um, And, like, others are at least have some useful information in them. There's a lot of of not-so-useful stuff out there as well. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Is is the um yeah, my my understanding of civil rights law you said in the nineteen sixties, it's been pretty I mean, there hasn't been a lot that's happened, legislatively especially, since say nineteen ninety one, the Civil Rights Act. I mean, it's it's been very minimal changes in the last thirty years. Is that correct? Uh, that's right, but the nineteen ninety one act um was really important. Um yes. it, it ended mm-hmm. up causing some real problems. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. Yeah, exactly. Your your articles. Yeah, I did not know. So I wrote. Um, so yeah, I mean, the reason you know I wanted you on because you're interested in the same things I'm interested in, uh, which is cultural phenomenon wokeness, and it's sort of how it can be traced and how it relates to law. And so, um, you know, I you've written some very good law review articles on this. I've written on this too, but I, I you know, the, your recent articles I've read and I've actually learned learned a bit from. You have a uh, one recent one that's you know directly on this point wokeness uh, about. 
They're called the Roots of Wokeness. I, I'd like to start, though, with one that was from two years ago, because I think it sets the stage for the next one very nicely. Um, and this article was in the New York University Journal of Law and Liberty. It's called Title VII Disparate Impact Liability Makes Almost Everything Presum- Presumptively Illegal. I, I, I love that title. It, it's, it's an extreme case about the law. And I, I've written about disparate impact. I understood disparate impact. And I, I think I, I, I could have put all that together in my head, but I never put it exactly like that a law that makes everything illegal. And I think that's just a perfect formulation. Uh, before before we get into that, can you explain to people um, just like what Title VI is and what Title VII is of the Civil Rights Act? Because I think that's going to be important for, uh, for the rest of the discussion. Absolutely. The, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is probably the single most important civil rights statute um, passed by Congress. Um, and the two areas of it that are most important to us today um, title seven, a lot of people have heard that title seven, title seven, title seven. That's the part of the federal law, uh, that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, or national origin. So it applies to all employers, uh, of a certain size. Um, and, you know, it is, it is extremely important, uh, piece of legislation. Title six, uh, prohibits discrimination, not just in employment, uh, but basically in anything by a federally funded entity. So, for example, universities almost always get some sort of federal funding, and they can't discriminate on the basis of, of race, color, or national origin uh, on account of Title VI. Yeah, and so it's, it's schools, it's basically, I mean, locales, it's pretty much, I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's, almost, it's almost everything, isn't it? Because there's a uh, you know, like every, everything gets federal funding at some level. I mean, policing does, you know, schooling does. So a I think there's very a lot of private employers wouldn't be covered by Title VI. Um, and uh, now and then you run across a university like Hillsdale, uh, yeah, which refuses to take avoid money. getting federal funding because there's so many laws out there and so much red tape and so much bureaucracy that a university that is free to do what they think is best is kind of a it's a rarity, of course. Um, yeah. And it's, it's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. So when you, so yeah, so when people are, you know, when people just so when people know, like when they're reading the news, there was just a story in the Washington Post the other day, um, you know, when they're doing stuff like, uh, uh, when the federal government is coming in on the trans women in sports debate, they're actually using title IX, which is something different from, uh, the 19, yeah, that's actually what's a little bit later. But yeah, but but it, it, title six is sort of the superstructure. The, the title IX is just elaborating on, on yeah. title six, right? So I, the fact that they could, yeah, title IX applies to sex. It applies to education institutions in particular. Um, and not to everybody that receives federal funding. And it's got, you know, some exceptions, you know, that are, that are appropriate for sex rather than race. Uh, but they're very similar, very similar. Yeah. Okay. So your article, you know, you say Title Seven. This is the this is the one related to employment makes out presumptively everything illegal. So if you just look at the, you wouldn't get that from the uh, text of the uh, of Title Seven itself. Which basically is just, you know, something sounds very innocent and anodyne, probably would get 90% support, you know, if you should just showed it to people, right? It's something like, you know, you can't discriminate basically just based on race, sex, color, national origin, right? Those are those are the categories. I, I would say more than 90%. I bet you get 95%. <laughs> you might have some libertarians who might say, uh, yeah. uh, you know, like, you have, you have, libertarians are not as, as common as you might think. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. So a vast majority of people would say it was okay. And then, you know, the people who voted for it in Congress, you know, they've obviously got a majority of Congress. Um, and so how did this get twisted into something that presumably makes, uh, presumptively makes everything illegal? Oh, my. <laughs> it didn't take long. It really didn't. It was so, it happened fast. Um, and what's funny is that members of Congress in 1964, they were aware of this possibility. And they like, when they bent over backwards uh, to make sure that it wouldn't happen. Um, you know, Everett Dirksen, who was the minority leader uh, in the Senate, you know, wanted to make sure that the, the, the uh, statute would say that, that you have to intentionally discriminate. Um, and yet, and yet, only a few years after um, Title VII passed, the EEOC uh, was telling employers, no, 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 it's not just intentional and discriminate, discrimination, but if you have a job qualification um, that, that tends to screen out more persons of one race than another, um, and you don't have you know, a rock-solid business necessity for this, um, yeah. then that itself um, is 
is um, a violation of Title VII. And you like sort of knock yourself out and look at the statute's wording. You know, where does it say um, that job qualifications cannot have what they call a disparate impact or an adverse impact? Uh, and it doesn't say that anywhere. In fact, in many places, it says just the opposite. Um, yeah. This is, yeah, this is, I mean, this is the amazing thing about reading the uh, sort of the, your summary of the legislative history, um, because it's like, it's not like people didn't foresee that this could happen. There was a case in Illinois, Illinois had its own version of, you know, its own anti-discrimination law. And basically they, um, it was Motorola, they tried to give a test and the test, you know, screened out uh, somebody and then, then a, uh, uh, some, a black man sued and said, you know, this is racist because basically the test, you know, screens out black people more than white people. And and so the, the the exact situation that would come up later, and you know what was what was the reaction to that in Congress? Oh my! I mean, they went crazy to say, "Oh, that won't apply to Title VII. That won't apply. That won't apply." Um, and the newspapers picked this up. Back in those days, the New York Times was 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 running in the opposite direction, and they had a pundit um, who was was saying, "You know, this is this is outrageous that the Illinois Fair Employment Practices Commission, or rather, just a lowly um, hearing officer." had held um, that either, it's, it's interesting because there's an, it's entirely possible that in the actual case against Motorola, Myark versus Motorola, uh, that they really were race discriminating, that they had lied and said that he'd flunked the test when actually he passed because he took the test in his, his lawyer's office later uh, and did fine on it. Uh, so okay. we'll never know. And, and, and Motorola said, we lost the test, so we can't show it to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, lawyer's office, I don't know if that's the most, you know, that's the most uh, uh, neutral. <laughs> that's true either. Conceded, conceded. <laughs> However, there was some evidence that he'd actually yeah. passed the test. And the fact that Motorola had lost the test was not, you know, that didn't cover them in glory. But all that aside, you know, the hearing officer then says, well, you know, either he passed the test or even if he didn't, uh, the test is 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 illegal because um, more more whites pass it than than, than African Americans pass it, um, and so that's when he starts going down this disparate impact road. And the New York Times says this is terrible, this is terrible, um, and members of Congress get you know vote on the floor of Congress and say this wouldn't happen under Title VII. Title VII doesn't doesn't have that effect, and yet just a few years later. The EEOC is saying, oh, yes, it does. Um, and the Supreme Court, um, to its ever everlasting discredit, as far as I'm concerned, um, in the case of Griggs versus Duke Power Company, which is in the early 70s, they say, we defer to the EEOC. We go with their interpretation because they're so much smarter than we are, uh, at least on these matters, so much more expert. Um, and you know, it's just stunning. It's absolutely stunning. Um, yeah. And it's even more than that. It's not that just Congress went crazy. They put a clause in the bill that just sounds like it was written for the Griggs case, doesn't it? It yeah, basically says that it, it was. The, it was written for the Myart case. Yeah. Um, you know, that Senator Tower from Texas, who ended up actually opposing Title VII. I mean, he was with, with the, the Southern segregationist on this, but he was worried enough about the Myark case that he puts a clause in that basically says, hey, you can use tests. Um, but even more important, um, Dirksen puts in something that says discrimination has to be intentional in order to be remedied. Uh, and Hubert Humphrey, who's the majority leader at the time, says, that's, that's fine, I'm, I'm okay with that amendment, but I just want to point out that it's unnecessary because that's, you know, that's already implicit in the notion of discriminating because of race, color, sex, religion, or national origin. I mean, that's what it means to discriminate because uh, of that, rather than because of how well someone did on the exam. Yeah. Is there, is there, I mean, are there, and so what do, what do people say? What do people who like the disparate impact say about the, the legislative history? When they, when, they, when they acknowledge, you know, when they acknowledge legislative history matters, what's the argument against, if there is any argument? You know, I have never heard anyone who supports disparate impact actually do a, a, you know, anything even remotely like a deep dive into the legislative history, or for that matter, into the text of the statute. Um, it's just that you know, their argument is we have to be able to do this um, or else we won't be able to fulfill the ultimate goal uh, of Title VII. So they take what you call a, a purposivist 
uh, approach to this to the statute. They say the purpose of this was to get rid of all the the obstacles to to African American employment success, and the way to do that um, is to to defer to the EEOC's uh, decision to go after disparate impact. Yeah. So yeah, people who haven't been to law school or people who aren't lawyers, you know, might not know there's different uh, schools of sort of interpreting text and interpreting constitution, right? And so some people will say, look at the plain words, and some people will say, um, look at what was originally intended by, you know, the legislators. And I think for a lot of people, that sounds like common sense. I mean, what else would you use, right? Besides, you know, if we're, if we're under the rule of law. And then the, the alternative case, it, it's sort of, it's hard to describe without like, Oh my, I find it hard to describe without sort of mocking it. I mean, it's basically, it's, you know, I'm trying to describe it fairly. It's so in the constitutional sense, they, they call it the living constitution, right? Um, which basically norms evolve and uh, things change and the world is not what it was in 1964. So, so maybe you apply something like that where you say sort of, I guess what, I, when I've, what I've seen them say is that basically, look, the nine, and what courts have said is basically the 1964 uh, 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 Civil Rights Act was meant to help black people, right? Um, and that's what it was concerned with. So therefore, um, you know, how are you going to sit there and stop us from helping black people? If we want to tell a company, you know, you have to have some balance or something, but like, you know, the, the Congress could have wrote a law that just said, help black people, right. Or, or do what you think is, do what you think is right. And you know, that's not what they did. They, they had a, they had debates over what helping black people meant and what, what the law should be in order to do that. Um, and then that that's what was you know debated in public forum, and that was what was that passed and signed by the president. And so you know what what am I missing here? What 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 response is there to that? You know, I'm with you. If the whole thing just sounds crazy. Uh, the idea that you should like you know continually go to a more abstract level of what Congress did uh, instead of what they actually said. We should look at you know at what they what they sort of you know in some cosmic sense wanted to accomplish. Um, and, you know, what was their purpose? Help black people. Well, you can take any statute, um, you know, take the Patriot Act. You know, the, the idea is, you know, to, 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 you know, further national security. And therefore, we should be able to interpret that act to do whatever it is that, that the president or whoever the bureaucrat is in charge of this uh, thinks is good for national security. That would be like crazy, just crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that's amazing. So, so you have this law, it has, you know, so that's the disparate impact standard of Title VII, basically anything you do, and it's not just employment, it's, it's every step of the process, right? It's like promotions, it's whatever, how you assign office space, I, you know, potentially anything is, is covered by the language. Um, and so to, 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 to sort of make the, make the final connection there, how does that make everything illegal? Basically, you know, everything that's done through employment with a relationship between an employer and employee, um, you know, they, they all have a disparate impact on some group. You got to remember that, that the, the um, you know, that lots of groups are covered by Title VII. So you can have a disparate impact on men, disparate impact on women. Think of how many religions are out there and how they differ from each other, not just you know, in the, the doctrine of their religion. Uh, for example, Unitarians uh, have very high levels of college degrees, uh, whereas Baptists have lower levels of college degrees. So if you require a college degree uh, for a particular job, um, then it's going to have a disparate impact um, on Baptists relative to Unitarians. Um, and, you know, this goes on absolutely forever. Uh, if you, for example, um, wanted uh, someone with experience in the donut industry, let's say that you are, are, are um, running a donut shop, you know, a, a little known fact, um, that is not something that, that is equal across all national origin groups. Cambodian Americans have more experience in the donut industry. So you're giving an advantage to Cambodian Americans over uh, other groups. Everything has a disparate impact. You'd just be shocked. If you look into it, you will find um, that just, if it's not everything, it is so close to everything. Uh, there's always a group that will be better off or worse off um, because of whatever the job qualification is. Yeah. I'm I so yeah, go ahead. 
I used to offer $10,000 to be given to the favorite charity of whoever could come up with a job qualification that has actually been used in the world that doesn't, doesn't have a disparate impact on some group. I thought maybe left-handedness, right-handedness um, would, would count. Uh, because I, I can imagine to operate certain machinery, you need somebody who's either left-handed or right-handed. So I can imagine that being used as a job qualification. But it turns out that since left-handedness is thought to be um, you know, a negative quality in some ethnic groups, they train their children out of it at a young age. So that group is disproportionately right-handed. Um, so, I mean, just try to think of a job qualification that doesn't have a disparate impact on some group. Jockeys are just like, like Hispanic. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you could, you could imagine like you could do like a lottery. Um, and I guess that wouldn't, if that's not a qualification, that's just a lottery. But then even like how you recruited people for the lot lottery would probably have a disparate yeah. impact unless you're yeah. just taking the census data. You know, there's been, that's basically, there's, that's the only theoretical way not to have a, a disparate impact. And yet, you know, there are actually lots of arguments about, you know, advertising for a job on the Internet has a disparate impact because because certain ethnic groups, certain national origin groups or races uh, may have less access uh, to the Internet. So that would be taken very serious. Um, so. Yeah. So I think what you, so what this does, I mean, it makes everything, uh, you know, makes everything presumptively illegal. But obviously the government doesn't go after everything right um it could so so what is that so what's the process that you see in the, in the patterns of what they go after and what they don't well there's two different r routes here uh there are sometimes private lawsuits um so an individual can make whatever argument they they, they want to make um but most of this most of the action goes on at the eeoc uh and they get to pick out the the, the, the disparate impacts that they don't like and that gives them tremendous authority. Um, now, it's true that there are lots of agencies that have a lot of authority um, and they can, can prohibit the things. Congress over delegates to administrative agencies all the time, but it's particularly problematic um, at the, the EEOC because they don't have the power to issue notice and comment um, regulations. So they don't have the the the, the the procedures for going, you know, for saying we're thinking about prohibiting X, you know, we'd like to hear your comments um, on whether or not this is a good idea. I think we should explain to the audience. So the normal for a normal government agency, basically you go through a process where you say we're proposing role X, give us your comments of role X. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's some procedure, but the EEOC has a special, um, has a special status in law where it's an independent agency, right? Is that what they say? Rather no, than that's not what, what's weird is, is that actually Congress was trying to deprive them of that ability to issue substantive regulations. Um, they're allowed to, to promulgate um, procedural regulations. They can, they can say, we're thinking about requiring complaints to be on yellow paper and then blah, 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 you know, sort of procedural stuff. They can do that. But they actually were deprived of the power um, to issue uh, ordinary substantive regulations under the notice and comment procedure that you were just, just referring to. And that was an effort to make the EEOC less powerful. And weirdly, weirdly, it's done the opposite. It's made them more powerful um, because after the Supreme Court agreed with them about disparate impact, that meant, well, somebody's got to be the one to say, which disparate impacts are we going to take seriously and which ones are we not going to take seriously? Um, and so they can just do it by issuing what's often called a guidance um, instead of going through the long procedure and, and listening to other people, particularly employers, unions and such about, about you know, a particular proposal. They can just issue it off the top of their heads if that's what they want to do. Uh, and they can go after it um, retroactively. They can look to see, um, you know, what's what employers are doing. And they can say to themselves, well, you know, we don't like that particular job qualification. Does it have a disparate impact? Well, surely it will, you know, against some group. And they can go after that one um, without any kind of procedure. Um, yeah. So, the, so, yeah. So, I mean, so in like concrete terms, like, for example, one of the things they do go out after um, and they have gone after and it's been the subject of lawsuits is criminal background checks. Right. So the, the idea is that blacks, um, I don't know if they think about Hispanics, but blacks, at least um, when you 
check for criminal background, you do criminal background checks, that screens out disproportionate uh, number of blacks. Now, this, this, this same uh, procedure obviously has a disparate impact on men too. Um, but it's, it's never, it's never about that. Right. So, so basically, you know, the, the law is supposed to be colorblind. And this is what they said in 1964. You know, there's a uh, quotes from senators, things like it, you know, it makes discrimination against a black person just as, uh, illegal as a discrimination against a white person. Right. And especially in the, uh, in the context of quotas. So, you know, technically it's supposed to be race, sex blind discrimination is wrong, but in practicality, I think you said at one point in the article, you're, you're, you're not sure if the EOC has ever done a disparate impact case on behalf of white whites or males is that is that right i think that's still true yeah it was certainly true when i wrote it yeah. um but, but, do you even know of intention are there even intentional discrimination cases against whites or males that they've gone after i mean there have been cases um that have been brought privately i am not aware of one that was been has been brought by the eeoc the eeoc at first in 1964 they didn't have any power to bring any lawsuit against anybody uh it wasn't until 1972 that the authority to bring lawsuits against against employers that have a pattern or practice uh, of discriminating was transferred from the Department of Justice to the EEOC. Uh, they had put it at the Department of Justice because, precisely because they were worried the EEOC, because it's an independent uh, agency, is just not that answerable politically. Uh, the president can't be punished for what the EEOC does, but the president can tell the attorney general um, and, and, and have some control over what sort of cases the Department of Justice brings. In 1972, they, they, they take the power away from the Department of Justice, give it to the EEOC, and that, that was hugely important because now it meant that if the EEOC issues a guidance saying the following you know, job qualification that has a disparate impact, we're going to go after it. They can follow through and do it now. Uh, you know, they can they can actually enforce what they're saying. Uh, so that was an important moment, and I don't think anybody was really thinking clearly uh, about yeah. what effect that would have. Yeah, yeah. Who um, you know, personnel is so important. So they even the fact that they're not a uh, regular administrative agency it means the appointment process and the uh, hiring and firing work differently, right? So like it's a normal government department, like State Department or something. The president comes in, he appoints the you know Secretary of State, Under Secretary of whatever, um, has all these political appointees, and and so they they follow the um, they tend to follow sort of the the uh, program or the policies of the of the president, you know, State Defense. Uh, Department of Justice. It, it, the EEOC, it's a different setup, right? Can you explain explain the difference? Well, the trouble is, it's not so clear what the difference is these days. Um, in general, the EEOC commissioners um, are, are appointed for a term. Um, but like, actually, I can't remember exactly how, how Biden did it, but Biden ended up, uh, up firing uh, some people in the EEOC that had been put there during the Trump administration. Um, and I think some of that might be in litigation right now. I'm not sure. Uh, but at any rate, in general, the EEOC has been thought to be um, somewhat independent um, of, of the presidency. You know, the president cannot issue um, a, a, a um, demand that the EEOC behave in a particular way. They get to do what they want. Yeah. So like a, a president cannot come in and say, you know, like I'm going to fire the EEOC. I'm just going to appoint new people. There, there's legal hurdles. There are definitely legal hurdles. And then right now they're, they're a little bit more in, in doubt than they have been in the past. Uh, how about, um, you know, how about, ex can, can an executive order bind the EEOC? It's part of the executive branch. Can the executive order say, you know, this should be the standard or something like that? Uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think that that's, that would work. Um, so it is sort of an interesting question. Could we come up with something that a president can do that would affect the EEOC? Uh, that's, that's a question we're going to have to reserve for another day. Um, but, you know, I think the general, it's generally correct uh, that the president has a lot more, more effect on what happens at the Department of Justice and can affect policy there um, in a way that they would have a very difficult time affecting uh, at the EEOC. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I, what this sounds like is basically, you know, it's a law. It makes literally everything illegal. And then, which that means is, you know, government doesn't have unlimited resources. And so it's basically, I mean, this is the definition of arbitrary government power, right? Everything is illegal. You choose what you like and what you dislike, and then you make the law that way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's how, that's how it works. And I think that the criminal background check example is a good one. Uh, I think there are probably many people who would like to see laws that, that you know, 
promote the employment um, of people who've been let out of prison recently. And actually, we have such laws. There are government subsidies, tax subsidies um, that allow for that. Uh, but the EEOC decides they're going to somehow force that out of a law that simply says you can't discriminate on the basis of race or sex or national origin. Uh, and, you know, that's not the way to do it. Um, and, but that's what they've done. Um, and they've done it in a way that, that basically allows them to control policy over this issue. Uh, I would much rather policy on this issue be controlled um, by, by Congress. Uh, and yet that's not what's happening. This is a very ham-fisted way to try to promote uh, employment by ex-felons. We'd be much better off with the other policy that we have, and that is a tax subsidy, because that allows employers who are in a good position, have the right jobs, um, you know, and can supervise employees who've recently been let out of prison and made the decision that, that with this tax subsidy, they're, they're, that they can do this. That works pretty well. Uh, forcing employers uh, to hire ex-felons, that doesn't work nearly as well. Um, and the EEOC claims, and I think this is like, this just drives me crazy. Even if there's a state law that tells employers you cannot hire um, someone who has, has committed a felony and been convicted of a felony. You cannot hire them for this very sensitive job. Um, the EEOC says, no, it doesn't matter what state law is because federal law trumps state law uh, and we can make you hire fel ex felons. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the, on the, on the, um, you know, what's legal and what's illegal. So the, the, the prototypical case of disparate impact, I mean, it's Griggs and that's, you know, where, where this doctrine, uh, you know, starts within the courts. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, cognitive tests uh, do have a disparate impact, um, but then college degrees also have a disparate impact, right? So it, it's a strange thing that uh, cognitive tests are pretty much presumptively illegal. I mean, technically, yes, you could show business, but in practicality, it's expensive and hard, and you know, people tend not to want to do it. Um, and then the, uh, but then the college degree is the same thing. So, you know, is there an explanation in law or like legislative history or anything we could point to that could say why IQ tests are, are presumptively illegal or can be problematic, but not college degrees? Yeah, it's not just IQ tests because the, you know, it's any kind of a written test is very, very hard to, to get past the EEOC. You know, the rules make it so that you have to spend, you know, very substantial sums of money and time trying to show them this test is a good test um, and it doesn't have a disparate impact. Um, and, you know, the only explanation that comes to mind is, is that the EEOC likes colleges and universities. Um, you know, that's a democratic constituency. I don't know, a very progressive constituency because otherwise it is just baffling uh, because it is, you know, Particularly for, for Latinos, there is a, a, a very substantial disparate impact. There's a disparate impact based on religion that's, again, very strong. Um, and why do they prefer colleges and universities? But they like them. <laughs> what I mean by saying, you know, this is very arbitrary. Um, yeah. So, yeah, somebody could, I mean, somebody could presumably bring a uh, Title VII suit on a college degree, you know, based on a college degree as a requirement for employment, right? Uh, but, I, you know, I think these things, you know, I think the courts, it's it's presumably, you know, independent, but it, it can, it looks to the EEOC, it seems like the EEOC sort of sets the, the cultural sort of norms in, in this area. So exactly. you can try some novel legal th theory or novel thing, but they probably, it'll probably get ignored, right? That makes sense to me. I mean, you know, you occasionally there are novel cases um and you know usually you don't get a decision out of that at all it's just that you know employers want to avoid these lawsuits so they will they will you know try to to deal with it and try to to to, to settle such lawsuits uh, but, you know mostly mostly the law comes out of the eeoc yeah yeah, so uh, so that, that, that sort of sets the background of, of Title VII and what's happened to it. And then, so your other article, this just came out um, uh, last month. It said, The Roots of Wokeness, uh, Title VII Damage Remedies as Potential Drivers of Attitudes Towards Identity Politics and Free Expression. Okay, that's, uh, that's a mouthful. My mind was just, woke institutions, it's just civil rights law. So I'm going, you're, you're the different between a uh, legal uh, a law review article and then a, uh, <laughs> just, a, just a blog. But I think we, we touch on many of the same ideas. Um, but there were still a lot 
lot in here that you know I didn't think of, and the way you put it, I think is is great. Can you um, can you explain what's the general case for um, how you first of all how, how do you define wokeness? Because I have a, I have a def- my own definition. Other people have their own. Do you? I don't remember if you actually defined it in the paper. Is it just sort of one of those? In the article, I just picked up a dictionary definition of wokeness that I pulled out the internet because I wanted to be able to say, look, you know, I'm not going to give you my spin on this. You know, and I think the dictionary definition was just something like, you know, highly attuned uh, to issues of race and sex, um, you know, something along those lines. I'm willing to go with with that definition. I mean, highly attuned to the point of being silly, uh, I think, is, 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 is accurate. Um, but when I talk about roots of wokeness, I'm talking about how the, the country seems to have gone um, you know, off the deep end now in yeah. trying to define everything in our history, in our culture, uh, in terms of an effort to somehow disadvantage uh, racial minorities uh, or women. Um, and I think it's, it's become, it's gotten out of hand here, uh, gotten way out of hand. Yeah, that's you know that's a funny definition because you say highly attuned to race and gender. I mean that would that would that would pertain to the Ku Klux Klan, right? They are highly attuned to, to issues of race, aren't they? So it, it, I think there has to be so it, it's more of a um, in a certain way, right? I think the definition needs a little bit more than. But I, I think it's one of those things where you know you sort of you know it when you you, you know it when you see it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how do, how do, so how do you how do you connect it to policy? Um, what are what are sort of the there's I think you know there's there's regular law and then but then there's like you know there's the way law works in most cases and I think that civil rights law just has you know why you know it had the potential I think what you're what you're saying in your piece to uh, have an outsized cultural impact in a way that other laws don't. So for example, we give money to, you know, farmers, right? Um, and it's not like we became a country, you know, that that ever had the potential to make us, you know, obsessed with farming. Maybe it does subsidize like rural lifestyles and maybe there's some downstream cultural effects. Maybe country music, you know, exists because of, you know, subsidies, you know, the US Department of Agriculture. You know, you could make a you know you could make some kind of argument like that. Um, but I don't think, you know, I think most things in law are not like that. And I think civil rights law is special. So can you talk about that and how, what you see the connection is between uh, law and the culture? I think that that fateful moment um, was in 1991 when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1991, which amended Title VII. Uh, Back in 1964, um, the remedies uh, that were available if you could prove a Title VII case were very limited. And by remedies, I mean, you know, what happens when you win a lawsuit Uh, What does the court order? Does it order money? Does it order an injunction? Um, And back in in 1964, um, you could get lost wages um, if you you could prove discrimination. Um, And you could get an injunction. You could get a a court to order that a particular employer hire you or promote you or or, or get a a certain amount of of salary in the future. Uh, But what you couldn't get you couldn't get emotional distress damages. You couldn't, you couldn't get that. Um, and you couldn't get punitive damages. Um, in 1991, um, they changed that. Um, and what they essentially did is they put Title VII on steroids. You know, instead of it just being an ordinary cause of action where you had to be able to get, um, you know, you had to be able to show lost wages in order to get money. Um, you could get attorney's fees, but you couldn't. That was, that was unusual, so it was generous in that respect. But now not only can you get lost wages, an injunction, attorney's fees, now emotional distress damages, uh, and possibly punitive damages. And that especially affected the harassment side of Title well, was it, wasn't, I'm sorry, wasn't, the, um, wasn't it before 1991? Couldn't you get punitive for just race and not sex, or am I remembering that wrong? And then I, I know that I, I don't know if punitives for anything, but you could get you possibly could get punitives uh, at the hiring stage under Section 19, 1981, which is a different statute. Uh, OK, so, uh, yeah, so 1991, I guess, made it you know easier to get punitive or maybe start punitive for. Yeah, OK, under the Civil Rights Act, but especially for. Um, yeah, I, I, you're probably right. Uh, so, yeah. but the sex the sex thing is what is what actually took off. So, 1991, we know. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, so, in 1991, um, things change, especially for harassment causes of action. Um, so, racial harassment, but especially sexual harassment, because that was what was on everybody's mind in 1991. 
Yeah, this uh, was a few months after the Clarence Thomas hearings. That's uh, it wasn't yeah, the best. Yeah, you know, it's time. funny. They they all they you know the newspapers all reported uh, that because of the Clarence Thomas hearings, um, that suddenly the number of sexual harassment cases skyrocketed. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't it. It was the, it was this act, and the act had already been drafted, and it already said um, everything it was going to say about this. Um, and, you know, it may be that a few people, you know, were paying attention to the Clarence Thomas hearings and thought, you know, sexual harassment, I think I'll file a, I think I'll file a, 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 a complaint. Uh, but basically, it was suddenly you could get money for emotional distress. And for most cases of harassment, whether it's racial or sexual, there won't be any lost wages. And so prior to 1991, um, it was really only very serious cases that tended to be litigated. But after 1991, anybody who was upset with their employer, particularly if they'd left their employer for a different reason, maybe they'd been fired for something that had nothing to do with race or sex, and they wouldn't have been able to prove that it did. Maybe they left because they wanted to leave. Uh, but now they can turn around and say, and by the way, I was harassed. Um, and they could um, get substantial damages. Um, and, you know, to some degree, you could say, well, that's Congress authorized it. That's what they wanted. But I bet they weren't quite thinking about all of the different ramifications here. Because harassment, what is, what is harassment? What constitutes enough harassment to where you ought to be able to, to bring a lawsuit? Back when it required lost wages, um, you know, it just wasn't going to, it didn't matter that the, that the definition was vague. Uh, because it had to be bad enough to have caused the person to lose wages. Uh, either they had to be fired because they weren't cooperating with the harasser, or the harassment had to be so terrible that it was just they had to leave before getting another job. Uh, that, that's going to require some kind of harassment. Now, you know, after 1991, uh, the fact that the definition was so vague, um, you never know what a jury is going to do. Um, and, you know, that mattered a lot. What mattered, I think, even more, prior to 1991, the Supreme Court had defined harassment in a way that allowed it to be proven by cumulative incidents. So you could have, like, 20 different colleagues, and one of them said, you know, gosh, you know, you look nice today, Miss Snodgrass. Um, and, you know... Perfectly, you know, nice person isn't trying to, to harass anybody. You know, just wants to say you look nice. Well, that could be added to, you know, the next person in the office said something that, that was, you know, told a little off color joke that wasn't even directed at this particular employee, but she overheard it. Um, and the next person might have posted a, a picture of, of his wife in a, in a bikini. And, you know, it, it, it potentially yeah. can... These are, these are all real cases. You're not making these up. I mean, they, these have things that have been cited in some kind of These things ways. have yeah. at least have been, been the subject of litigation. Yeah. Uh, I, I made up the name Miss Snodgrass, but, but yeah. you know, all of these things have, have, have been, been thought of as possible contributing factors uh, to a, a, a harassment cause of action. So because it's cumulative, Every employer is, is suddenly thinking, whoa, we're going to avoid, you know, the, this kind of litigation. Um, we've got to not just tell people not to act outrageously. We've got to start telling them that every little thing that might contribute, we've got to, like, put the brakes on all of it. Because we, we can never tell when you reach the point where the Supreme Court would have agreed this is serious enough uh, to where uh, you can collect damages. Um, so that cumulative aspect of it is just hugely important. Um, so immediately employers want to start, you know, gathering their employees together and giving them a nice course on what not to do. Um, and it would, it would be, don't do a lot of things that previously would have thought of, would have been thought of as completely innocuous. Yeah. Yeah. He, so Eugene, Eugene Volokh has a great paper on this. So he basically says it can be cumulative. You don't, you don't even know what the lines are. So basically, what do you do if you're an employer? You say, don't talk about sex. Don't make any kind of, you know, any kind of joke that could be interpreted the wrong way because it's cumulative. It's not like, okay, here's this one person. Uh, you know, 40% of you can make a joke or, or say something, you know, about their looks or something like that. That, that, that's not a workable standard. Um, so yeah, from that, you know, from that standpoint, you know, all of, you have to expect employers are going to do what they have to do. 
Um, and, you know, prior to 1991, when they weren't thinking money damages, you'd get people, particularly, you know, on college campuses. And colleges are our are, are employers, just like everybody else. But there were, there were more people who were ideologically oriented towards stopping uh, harassment prior to 1991. And they really got the upper hand on campuses uh, after right. 1991. Um, yeah. And they just went crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think people don't realize this. I mean, we, we could talk about the way the laws are written. You could say, oh, it has an exception. It has this, it has, it has that. But, you know, most people who are running a business, they are, they're not lawyers and they have a thousand laws and regulations to think about. Right. And so, you know, what are they going to fall back on? They're going to fall, fall back on hard, easy rules that are going to make their lives as easy as possible. Right. Um, so this thing like, oh, can I do this test, but business necessity, but, you know, standard of proof this, or, you know, cumulative, you know, harassment, what's okay, what's not. It, they're likely, you know, they're not going to think all that. And so you could say, well, the law technically could give you a lot of wiggle room and, you know, this and that. Um, you just have to think of sort of pragmatically how it gets interpreted um, in the real world. And most people are going to, are just going to, exactly. It's not just lo not lawyers, even like the most even lawyers don't know. Yes, in, in the world, is yeah. to say, well, you know, technically it's not harassment unless it gets you know to to a pretty bad level. But what can I tell my employees other than like, don't do anything that can contribute to this? You know, it's a totally rational response, and the employees then sit through a training program that says, you know, don't do this, don't do anything that might be be interpreted as 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 a contributing factor to 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 a harassment cause of action. And not only do the employees take that to heart and say, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell Miss Snodgrass that she looks nice today, um, but employees who might see themselves as potentially a target um, of, of harassment are now gonna be especially sensitized to, gosh, you know, if so-and-so tells me that I look nice, maybe that's really not very nice. I used to think of that as something that was nice when someone complimented me. And now I think of it as, as maybe, you know, I should, maybe I was being, being silly in the past for thinking the person was nice. Maybe down deep they're they're really just trying to harass me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do create a financial incentive to look at it one way and, and not another way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, There's, yeah. Yeah. So one thing about my, you know, one thing I, I really liked about this article is that when I wrote my, my article, you know, I, I put it, I put the blame on, um, the uh, innovations in civil rights law after the 1964 Act, so disparate impact and uh, the affirmative action executive orders, which uh, we haven't gotten, we haven't gotten to. But basically, um, and a lot of people said, okay, well, wokeness seems more recent than that, and I sort of didn't really have a good response to that. But I, and I, I knew of the existence of the 1991 uh, Civil Rights Act, um, but I think what you, what you, what I learned from your article um, was just how important it was. And so if you look back at sort of a timeline of when this stuff started, yeah, I mean, wokeness in 1991 is not the same thing as wokeness in 2010. I mean, it's definitely got a, a different flavor to it and there's new new stuff like trans issues and, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, when you look back when sort of people started talking about PC as like a big enough issue to get people's attention, um, it was the 1990s, right? So the timeline the timeline does match up. You, you mentioned uh, uh, about the universities, how uh, you, how after 1991 they got a um, they got the upper hand. The people who wanted to censor speech and basically the, uh, the wokes uh, started to get uh, started to um, move into power. Can you talk about that a little bit? Can you talk? Do you, do you connect that to the 1991 law? Do you think there's a uh, case to be made that there's a connection there? Oh yeah, I think there is. I think there is. I mean, on every campus, like during the the, the, the late 1980s, when you started to get these hate speech codes. Um, the, the courts basically, um, you know, struck back on, and a lot of these hate, hate speech codes did not turn out to be that much of a problem in the early 90s. Uh, but like, as time goes on, if you figure there are people on every campus, and usually the general counsel who will take academic freedom seriously, will take the need for free expression seriously, they know they're a university, but their job is to keep the university out of trouble. Um, and so they kind of switch sides if they're practical um, and thinking, you know, what, I'm, what I've got to do as general counsel or as associate general counsel um, at the university is keep the school from getting sued. Then they start leaning in the direction of, of the, 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 the folks with the, the strong politically correct ideology because they know, hey, otherwise there's going to be a lawsuit um, and we will lose some of these lawsuits. Um, so they kind of switch sides over to the, 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 the practical minded administrators, start becoming sympathizers 
um, with the progressives who want strong controls on speech. Um, and I think for that reason, because those, those, um, the progressives with that ideology were already on campus and they're already pressing for this. Uh, universities, I think, have gotten it worse than anywhere else. Meanwhile, the federal government started demanding more Title IX officers on campus. So you get people whose whole job is about this. And you have to add to that, there's, there's another aspect of the law that I think made this worse than it otherwise would be. And it's an aspect that is understandable. There was already law that an employer cannot retaliate against someone who makes uh, a complaint. Um, and you can see why that would be true. You don't want to say, you know, so-and-so is complaining that they were discriminated on, against on the basis of sex or race, and that, that wasn't true, but we fired them because they made a complaint that, was, that, was, that we did. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they developed this notion in the law starting in the 1960s and 70s uh, that you can't retaliate against someone who makes a complaint. Well, you know, fast forward to the 1990s and the early 2000s, every time someone on campus makes a complaint, um, the university officials have in mind that they're not supposed to tell this person, you're an idiot, that's ridiculous. They sort of like, oh, well, you know, we'll take this very seriously, we'll investigate. And that just, you know, enters the culture in itself where people are used to the notion of if you make a complaint, um, suddenly everybody will sit up straight and take you very seriously. Um, and that has not, you know, that's, that's not been a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's fascinating because it's just such a different way of seeing the woke phenomenon um, than, you know, I think what most people imagine when they're, you know, when they're critics of the, the critics of it. Right. So I think most people imagine just sort of the ideas are having, are just like, you know, operating sort of in a free marketplace of ideas, right. They're having a force of their own. So, you know, somebody complains to the university administrator, the university administrator is either sympathetic to free speech or sympathetic towards, you know, multiculturalism and diversity and this stuff. And and I guess what's happened in the last 20, 30 years, they'd say as well, the administrator has become, you know, believes less in free speech and now believes in, you know, whatever. Um, and the same thing with, you know, everything else. Oh, the, ca you know, the, the corporation, well, capital, right? Oh, um, you know, MasterCard must have just become, you know, very interested in sexual orientation and gender identity, you know, lately without any, <laughs> without any connection to anything else going on in the world. And, you know, you're, you, I, I think, you know, this, I think your view of the world, you know, my view of the world is most people are not ideologues, right? Most people are not like me or you or like the wokes. They're not sitting around. They don't have a strong opinion on free speech is better or diversity and inclusion are better. Um, they're just trying to do their, their day job and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to not get in trouble and not cost their company or their institution a lot of money. Um, and they're trying to get along with people. Um, and in that case, the law can have, you know, a huge effect because the law is just sitting there and it's just sort of putting its thumb on the scale. Mm -hmm. And if people are just going along to get along, cumulatively, it becomes a really, really big deal. And eventually you see every institution taken over by these ideas. Yeah, exactly. You know, these, these major corporations, you know, at some point they started hiring people into offices who could deal with the problem. Um, and they got colonized in that way. Uh, and they're, you know, the average person working for these corporations wants to make sure that things run smoothly, uh, that they don't get sued, they don't get, get protesters. And after 30 years of this, it affects the culture. Um, you know, people start thinking along those lines. Um, you know, always important to, to recognize not only does culture affect law, uh, that we pass the laws that, that, that we, you know, we, we believe in, presumably, or that, that, that members of Congress, members of state legislatures, city councils, administrative agencies believe in. Uh, but the law affects the culture as well. Uh, we're all trying to navigate successfully through the, this maze of laws. Um, and that has an effect, um, a very powerful effect, particularly over long stretches of time. Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought the idea that basically culture is the main force here and law is like, there's limited. I thought that was always very sort of convenient for Republican politicians. I don't know if they invented that idea, but they, it's sort of very convenient for them. You know, politicians, what can we do? <laughs> it's like, it's just the culture. It's just, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing that for uh, a government to do in a, you know, in an open society, if it's, we're not an authoritarian, you know, regime, um, if it's just culture, you can't, you can't change the culture, but you're right. It does have, you know, I, I'm convinced that absolutely, you know, I, Think that that the um, 
because you see actually the other thing about the 1991 law that you see and why the timing uh, works is because you see the explosion in Title VII lawsuits um, in the 1990s. So you see a couple things happen in the 1990s. You see the explosion of Title VII. You know, they go up for a while, but then they go really up in the 1990s. Um, and then you have sort of the wokeness wars on college campuses. Um, and basically, we've been living with you know wokeness. You know, it's ebbed and flowed a little bit, but basically, we've been living with it ever uh, ever since. And I think really, really picked up in the last you know 10 years. I think that's that's when everyone. It became like, you know, you, you couldn't avoid it, but, you know, we were, the universities were there for 20 years and they were sort of the canary in the coal mine and then progressively other things um, fell under its uh, sway. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, this is all, you know, fascinating. You've, you've you know, you've done, you've been in sort of the policy space. I don't know if the Civil Rights Commission is a policy space, but you're in, you're in sort of the, the political realm a little bit. Um, you know, it's so, so sort of, you know, a little bit, confusing to me because so in 1964 right there was this consensus that discrimination has to be intentional this was everyone in the you know in the senate from the right to the left in 1991 the law is passed and i think it gets something like 90 senate votes right and so it's dem all democrats and then almost all republicans too i know it's a compromise you know bush uh the senior uh, bush senior vetoed the original civil rights act of 1990 but then he signs it in 1991 so this is a compromise that the republicans were willing to live with in 1991 um so, you know, what, I mean, we had, this was after the Reagan revolution. So you think, you know, conservatives are supposed to be conser more conservative now. Um, and so, you know, th th this is just questions, not just about the 1991 act, but basically, you know, what have Republicans been doing all this time? They're terrified of these, you know, deer in the headlights. They, they don't like issues of, 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 of civil rights. They don't like issues of race uh, or sex. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, you know, back in, during, during, um, the, the first Bush administration, when this was passed, uh, it started out that the White House Counsel's Office um, during the Bush administration was very strong and was doing, I thought, a great job um, in like pointing out what's wrong um, with the with with the act and was was fighting it. And the word finally came down from the political people in the White House: this has got to go through. There's got to be an act, you know. So do what you can right now. Uh, but there's, you know, the president is going to sign an act. Um, and so it was driven by the political people, not by the, by the, by the lawyers. Uh, I think the lawyers generally did understand that this law was going to be a problem. They focused more on the disparate impact side of it. And I think ultimately um, the emotional distress damages um, and, and the um, punitive damages side of it was actually more important. Um, than, than the disparate impact side of it, uh, but the disparate that, that was model, that was modeled anyway. Nobody really knew what the disparate impact. Uh, well, what happened was because money damages are only available for intentional discrimination. Now that part of it didn't apply to disparate impact. So when it comes to private lawsuits, everybody wants to allege intentional discrimination, and the EEOC is left in the space to play with disparate impact. Uh, and and as we said, is very arbitrary about how they do it. Um, host hostile environment is. Uh, intentional, right? It doesn't have to be like, I want to discriminate against you for being a woman. It, it's basically like, you know, we make sexist jokes. We do that intentionally. That, that technically you get, you, of course you get punitive damages for that. Yeah. It's sort of, you, in, you intentionally told a dirty joke. Um, <laughs> I intentionally discriminated. You intentionally told a dirty joke, which is okay. Yeah, a kind of harassment. Yeah, that's the, you know that's that's amazing. So, but but I mean, so is that I mean, the explanation that they're just afraid? So they're afraid of race issues. The biggest like uh, conservative sort of uh, issue in the country, or one of the biggest right now, is critical race theory. Um, so they seem like they're not completely allergic to talking or thinking about race or running on it, right? They, they do seem really to be some kind of good sign that finally people are are. are standing up uh, but note that this is grassroots level um, you know it is it is not you know Republican politicians conservative politicians uh, who have brought this to people's attention this is being brought to to, to the country's attention by parents uh, and they're seeing what their their, their, their children are doing at home um, and it's like whoa whoa this has really gotten out of hand um, and I think like at the end of May uh, 2020, uh, when George Floyd uh, is, 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 is killed, uh, and suddenly wokeness is like front and center of everything. Um, and for a moment, it seemed like the world was like changing while we were all locked in our living rooms. 
Uh, and I, I think that so many parents um, understood at that time, you know, this is going off the deep end on race. Uh, and so they're more alert to this than they otherwise would have been. Uh, but I think we're still not getting as, as, as much response from, from actual politicians, actual representatives of the people, uh, with a few exceptions who I, I, I'm happy about. Um, yeah. Yeah, I saw I saw Youngkin. I mean, early in when he uh, when he won the race in Virginia, he he did something. He disbanded the diversity office of the state, or something like that, or he got rid of, he fired them, or, or something, and did a critical race theory executive order. So I, I know they did another. They did one, and uh, either they had a law or an executive order in Florida too. So at least politicians. I don't know how effective these things are. Politicians seem at least to want the photo ops, and they want the headlines that they're doing something on on this stuff, right? Yeah, I think it's a good sign. My suspicion is that some of the statutes, if there are statutes or executive orders, will not be drafted perfectly. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm figuring the best thing to do is to, to, to start making as much noise as possible. Because uh, this is serious. You know, we're, we're teaching a generation of kids, um, you know, a, a history of, the, of their country um, that is incredibly biased. Um, and is you know, does not bode well for our future. Uh, we need to have something that is that is along the lines of, of the truth here. Uh, and you know, on the progressive side, they say, well, why shouldn't students learn about slavery? Why shouldn't they learn about Jim Crow? For goodness sake, we're all for yeah. that. Uh, yeah. But we're <laughs> also for making sure that they understand, you know, a balanced notion that like slavery has been around the world. Um, and a lot of people fought and died to, to, to stop slavery in this country. Uh, the, 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 um, the history of the country has its ups and downs, and they should learn about both, uh, not only about the downs. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I guess the other my question is you staying in that sort of a, a policy realm. Um, if someone is listening to this and they read your article and they uh, – and uh, they hear this podcast, and they basically, uh, they're concerned with wokeness, they think you're right, it's connected to civil rights law, and you know, they're convinced by your articles. Um, what would you advise them as far as what they should look for in politicians, or this could be advice for politicians too, or, or, or leaders, what would you want, like a Republican administration? Obviously, we can always think of, uh, uh, you know, legislation Congress could pass, I think that's, you know, probably unrealistic. Um, but as far as, you know, what would you want, say, in the next couple years out of the courts and out of the executive branch, assuming a Republican is in office to, to push back against the stuff? I think most of what needs to be done needs to be done in the courts right now because we need to undo some of the stuff. And right now we've got pending uh, before uh, the Supreme Court a case against Harvard University and a case against the University of North Carolina about race preferential admissions. And I think another root of wokeness comes simply from from these, these, these programs where students who happen to be from an underrepresented race, but are often members of the upper middle class themselves, um, they are admitted to a school where their entering academic credentials put them towards the bottom of the class. And, you know, some students are going to outperform their, their, their entering credentials. Other students are going to underperform their entering credentials, but most students are going to perform right about what their entering credentials say, you know. They're going to do the same level of work they were doing in high school or you know, shown by standardized tests or whatever. Um, and that has, that has been part of the, the ugly stew uh, of identity politics and wokeness where you've got students who would have done splendidly at a school that's like one rung down or two rungs down, but end up towards the bottom of the class and are resentful on account of it. Yeah. And, 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 they, and they put them I in mean, often they have these programs that, you know, these studies courses that aren't, you know, you know, they're less challenging subjects and they're very ideologically driven. And you could you can see, you know, how, how that would compound the problem. We'd have more African-American, you know, STEM majors going on to medical school, going on to 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 a job in the sciences and engineering. Uh, and instead, we get more that are that are in these these um, programs that are highly ideological. Um, and, you know, that's got to stop. We've got to come up with a way uh, to stop that. Uh, and that will affect the culture. It will take, you know, another 30 years to have more successful African-American um, adults in, in STEM areas and in other areas. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's the first thing on the list. Um, disparate impact. You know, we need to be able to make the argument now. Again, it's got to be made to courts. Um, disparate impact is in fact um, unconstitutional. 
because the 1991 Act, alas, enshrined, or at least arguably enshrined, disparate impact into the statute. Um, and that's been a big problem. And the easiest way out of that now, um, and it's not an easy way, uh, is to be able to argue that that is basically a form of discrimination itself. Um, and so that's another thing. Um, one more thing. Um, the so the so just uh, you talk about I mean, you talk about it uh, in, in the paper a little bit. So that argument for disparate impact to be unconstitutional. Can you just uh, make uh, just explain that real quick? Well, for one thing, you know, basically it it it, it has always been held um, that that um, it only applies to women and racial minorities. Uh, so that's the way it's always been applied. In which case, you know, we we protect women. We don't protect men. We protect racial, you know, we protect African Americans and Latinos. We don't protect um, whites, uh, and usually we don't protect Asians. Although sometimes uh, that works the other way. You know, that's got to be that's got to survive strict scrutiny all by itself. There, um, and I don't think it has a prayer of doing that. And what progressives have argued is, well, we'll apply it to everybody. Well, that's utterly incoherent. That means that nothing, you know, can ever ever be be good but it still discriminates because in certain certain kinds of, of, of industries and certain kinds of job qualifications um, you know we'll, we'll protect whites in certain areas and we'll protect blacks in, in, in other areas that's still you know that's just more discrimination so, so it's the basic the basic, basic argument is that um, title 7 by uh, t- saying you have to worry about disparate impact as an employer you're basically forcing an explicit discrimination right you're you're, you're basically you're uh, you have this one evil and then you fix it by an evil that's more suspect you can you know you can't for someone to discriminate, you know, you can't do this explicitly. You can't say you have to discriminate against white men, but you can't say nothing that has a disparate impact against blacks, which ends up just being, you know, discrimination against whites, right? Pick the job qualifications that that, that are, are are good for African Americans, and therefore are not as good for other groups. Yeah, uh, even if they're not as 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 useful at locating the right employee. Um, you know, you're you're protecting African Americans at the expense of, of non African Americans. Um, or you're protecting Latinos at the expense of non-Latinos. And, you know, that's discrimination in itself. It would have to survive strict scrutiny. I don't think it can. Uh, And I don't think saying, well, sometimes we'll we'll, we'll protect whites um, and and men um, against um, disparate impact. That doesn't help because it just means, you know, you've ghettoized everything. So in areas where whites don't do particularly well, um, but, you know, African-Americans do, you know, you're going to have to then choose job qualifications that disadvantage the African-Americans and they're being discriminated against. Uh, you know, if you did it, in, in, you know, for sports um, and said, you know, you have to, to change the qualifications for getting a job in the NFL so that more Asians can get in or more whites can get in or more women could get in, um, then, you know, you're basically harming people on the basis of their race um, or sex. Um, so you had, you had, you had, uh, so you say, yeah, affirmative action, you want the courts to do something on affirmative action. Uh, they, you know, the best thing to do would be say disparate impact is unconstitutional. Um, uh, anything else you're looking for out of the courts or any, any other branch of government? Oh boy, there's so many things. I mean, when it comes to education, um, and all this CRT stuff, um, you know, I, I don't really want the federal government to get involved there. I think part of the problem in the world is that we've centralized too many decisions. Um, and I am much more interested um, in, in, you know, having education issues become more local. Um, and in part, that means um, making it possible uh, for more charter schools, making it possible for more, more private schools. Um, and, you know, I want education to be more decentralized. Um, and I think that will generally help. Um, so I'm looking for a president, uh, I'm looking for a senator, I'm looking for state legislators uh, who see that and know that, that you know, decentralizing education is, is important. Education is one of those things where it's hard to measure and it's hard to know what's a good education and what's a bad education. So the best defense we have is always going to be, let's make sure that we're going to let you know, a lot of different approaches uh, reign. Yeah, yeah. 
it's hard. I mean, it's hard to know. You see this woke stuff in, in schools. You know, we have no idea how prevalent it. We, we can have anecdotes. We don't know if it's all, you know, 100% of schools now are 10% or it's really impossible to, to tell. You're right. I think, you know, our ability to even know how well the government is doing is, you know, difficult. So I think, yeah, you got to decentralize it. You might as well give people choices. What do you think about it? I mean, I've always thought that, the, you know, the, the uh, an obvious place to start, um, Executive Order 11246 uh, basically said, you know, the uh, if you have to have affirmative action um, among federal con- contractors, I looked it up, this covers something like 30% of the, uh, you know, American uh, workforce. I mean, government contractors are a lot of their subcontractors too. This seems like low-hanging fruit, right? It's just an executive order. You repeal it or you um, circumscribe it. That that is this uh, any any legal problem or uh, political problem with doing that? You know, there's a political problem. You know, there's a political problem with all of this because you of know course, yeah. people that, that benefit from from preferences of this sort. You know, they'll fight to the death to keep it. Uh, whereas people who are generally on the conservative side of, of 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 this, you know, this is not their number one issue. It's like you know, it's number ten. Um, and, and, you know, so you get the usual problem of, of, of the most vociferous um, people are going to be those who are saying, no, we want to keep racial preferences. We want to keep sex preferences. Um, should it be repealed? Yes. And like, if you look back in the 1970s, um, there was a case uh, about under Title VII, uh, and it was the Supreme Court case, a 5-4 decision, the Weber case, um, that said that even though... Title VII says on its face, you can't discriminate on the basis of race. They did the same thing they did in Griggs, say, well, you know, the purpose of all this is to help African-Americans. So you can discriminate in favor of African-Americans and have that sort of a, of a discrimination. They would limited it, it to a case uh, where the, the, um, where the um, employer had discriminated in the past, as Kaiser Aluminum and, and the, the Steelworkers Union had done prior to the, to the um, passage of the Civil Rights Act. And that has been taken ever since as, as permission to discriminate. Um, and one of the interesting things about the case is that the court says, well, you know, why shouldn't the steel workers in Kaiser Aluminum, the employer, be able to voluntarily, you know, give preferential treatment? Um, and the whole decision is, oh, this is voluntary. And I thought, for goodness sake, you know, the discrimination in the past was voluntary too, but it was bad, you know, it was bad. But the funny thing is it wasn't really voluntary. Um, it was being pressured by the, the, the executive branch pursuant to executive order 11246 uh, that, you know, called upon anybody that does business with the government uh, to have essentially quotas. I mean, they deny that it's a quota, but, you know, come on, when you tell employers, you know, we really, really want you to aim to have, have you know, a, a, a large number of, of minorities. Uh, they're told they have to do this and, you know, you say jump and they're going to answer how high. Uh, and that's what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you, would you, um, so the, the, the thing, you know, we can look forward to, I think in the immediate term is whether what's going to happen with the Harvard case and the North Carolina case. Do you have a uh, feeling? Would you make a prognosis on that? Well, what's your sort of intuition telling you about how that's well, going to go? I will tell you that my prediction is not worth um, two cents uh, <laughs> because I, I was really sure back in 2003 that we would get at least, you know, some movement towards um winding down racial preferences um, in the University of Michigan cases. Um, that is Grutter versus Bollinger and Grotz versus Bollinger. And the newspaper spun that one as, yeah, the, the two cases came out two different ways. So it's kind of splitting the baby, but it wasn't. Uh, it was easy to get around the Grotz case. Um, and the Grutter case was just, you know, basically told universities, as long as you do it the way we describe here, we'll let you do whatever you want. Um, and so I predicted that we would, we, that it would go the other way. And I was wrong. Nevertheless, nevertheless, you heard it here first. I predict that finally the Supreme Court will at least move us further in the direction, um, of, racial preferences and admissions at colleges and universities violate Title VI, as well as with a state university, um, the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope I hope you're right. You know, part, uh, doing a, you know, forecasting this stuff is hard because in the end, you're, you're, uh, 
you're guessing about the uh, you know the psychologies of of a few people, right? So you have a you know majority. You know how you know Alito and Clarence Thomas are going to rule, and you know how uh, the three liberals are going to rule, and then the other ones. You know, I think people feel good about Gorsuch, but you know, it's like like who knows? You know, they could do something creative or, or strange. Um, I yes, yeah, so, about Gorsuch. I mean, just you know, I actually the Bostock case. Um, even though you know he went off in a direction that's thought of as the progressive direction by saying that that Title VII forbids discrimination against transgender, um, the way he decided it, you yeah, know, very literal reading, yeah, yeah, it's just sort of a like, you know, a, 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 a woman in a dress would have been hired, so a man in a dress has to be hired too. <laughs> that's, that's sort of like you know, it, it, it's it's being really really textualist instead of going off in the direction we were talking about before, where you know you look at the purpose of the act. You say, I don't care about the purpose of the act. If he applies that same logic to the Harvard and and, and University of North Carolina case, uh, then he will be extremely strong uh, against race preferences. Yeah, of course you're you're right, and you know the, I guess the question is when, when you're forecasting this stuff, is that just sort of a psychological way to sort of you know give in to the left, or is it a principle you know can, uh, you know uh, uh, dedication to you know textualism, you know so people a lot of people have think it's the latter with Gorsuch, um, and so you know if you add him to Alito and Thomas, yeah, you got you got three, and then you know Kavanaugh, Barrett, you know Roberts, or we'll see. I mean, it's just it's just what these people decide yeah. <laughs> decide to do. Yeah. Um, well, it'll be, it'll be kind of fun to watch this. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I, if it comes out badly, I'm going to get a day to have a good cry because I think these race preferences have really been destructive. Uh, they have harmed the people that they are supposed to be helping, um, that we'd actually have more African-American scientists, physicians, lawyers, college professors, uh, if students were going to the school where they're entering academic credentials, made them competitive. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, go back to what you said about uh, conservatives, you know, this not being their main issue. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, I think uh, what we're, I think when we connect the civil rights stuff to wokeness, I, you know, wokeness, I think is, you know, pretty much the main issue. I mean, you look at the, you know, what, what's driving people, I mean, what's driving conservative media, it is really over the top. And so I think, you know, if you put it as, oh, executive orders, uh, affirmative action or disparate impact standard in Title VII, no, that's not going to make the top 100. If you say, this is wokeness, you know, that thing you really, really hate and you keep talking about, it's literally this, it, it, it's cl- it gets close to number one. I mean, it, it, it's... It, like, it's we, we go back to your, your, your point earlier, and that is it, the average person on the street sort of thinks this is the marketplace of ideas and they can't understand, yes. you know, mm-hmm. why, why these things are where they are. Um, and, you know, I want to say, look, you know, you, you have a law that allows schools or you have a, an interpretation of a law that allows schools to discriminate. And it's, it's contributing to the problem of wokeness. It's, it's, it's part of what causes people to think in those terms. And like by then they're often thinking about something else, like what they're going to have for dinner or, or, or how they have to yeah. deal with their <laughs> you know, And I don't blame them. We've all got to, we've all got to deal with, with our, our lives. Um, and not everybody's going to read Gail Harriet's law review articles. Um, yeah. You know, think about law review articles. Somebody asked me when I posted it on Twitter, somebody said, you know, is it normal for law review articles for the uh, footnotes to take up, you know, two thirds of the page? And I said, yeah, in law review, yes, maybe not another place. So people are, you know, feel free to skip the footnotes. It's like, it's a great, it's a great article, but you know, lawyers, you know, they tend to, they tend to like a lot of words in their, in their, uh, it's just different style. I used to uh, have a dean that would like, that's all he wanted to know about your article. How many footnotes were there? <laughs> it's not, that is, you know, it came time to, 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 to decide on people's salaries and how many footnotes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's been great, Gail. Is there, before I let you go, is there, uh, are you working on uh, anything you want to talk about related to wokeness or anything or civil rights law or anything close to it? You know, what I'm hoping to do um, is to, to write a book that includes some of the things that I've, I've written recently in law review articles. And you're right. You look at a law review article and the average you know, non-lawyer that isn't used to law review articles is thinking like, what are all these footnotes? Uh, I want to write something in, 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 in language that's a more approachable to the average reader. Um, and I am now working on getting, getting funding um, so that I can put all of this in a book uh, to where I get to say those same things, but say them in a very different style, say them in a way that, that, that somebody can actually, you know, take to bed and, and, and read like a chapter a night as opposed to like falling asleep on page one uh, when they look at all the footnotes. Um, okay, so- great. 
All right, great. Yes, I was always I always wondered about that. I said this stuff would be great at a in a book form. So I'm I'm glad you're thinking about doing that. Uh, great. Well, Gail, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully, this conversation will go out there and uh, and uh, let people think about these issues more in sort of a policy direction and practical terms of what they can do. Uh, thanks a lot. It's been really great. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>